Today on the Transplant Hope, we're going to be talking about the five stages or phases of transplant. Stay tuned. Hit the subscribe button and the bell notification to become part of the Transplant Helper community. Hey folks, welcome back to the Transplant Helper again today. My name is Jim Merle, and if you're like I am, when you were facing transplant initially, or maybe you are facing transplant right now, what you really want to know about this process is what's next. What is coming next? What can I expect? What are some of the phases or stages that I may go through as I go through this transplant journey. So because of that, I thought I'd sit down today and kind of evaluate with you and share what I believe to be the five major stages of transplant that pretty much uh, predominantly everybody goes through at least to one extent. So let's jump right in. The very first phase that I would say you're going to encounter is what I would call shock and awe. Shock and all. That is going to be the first stage of transplant that you're going to experience. Now, what I mean by that is when you are first told initially, when you are first told that you are going to be in need of a transplant of any kind, whether it's a heart, lung, liver, kidney, pancreas, or whatever, when you are first told that, that's one of those moments that, that just blows your mind. It shocks you. It puts you in awe. I can still remember vividly the day that I was told that a transplant would be my only option, how scared, how afraid, how terrified and, and anxious I was about the whole process. I had never in my life dreamt that transplant would be my outcome, even though I had grown up a congenital patient. So I certainly knew what it was like to have heart issues issues or heart problems, so to speak, I knew what that was like. But even still, when they walked in that room after that long five-hour heart cath I was involved in, and they looked down and said, Mr. Merle, we have no other options. Transplant is going to be your only option. If that doesn't happen, you have a very short time to live. That blew my mind. And I was in total shock from that. I can even remember at that point, basically looking at my family and saying, get out. Everybody, get out. I mean, I was angry. Get out. Just just go home. Go go somewhere else. I need to be alone for now. And I just laid there in the bed, kind of been stared at the ceiling. I turned the TV off, you know, everything you would normally do to try to pass the time while you're in the hospital. Shut all that down and stared at the ceiling and was just in just in shock and awe over what I was experiencing. And you're probably going to be much like that. If your name is is put right there in that same sentence with transplant, you'll probably be like that. And, and many of you already have been there and done that, so to speak. Number two, the second stage that I can see when you're going through the transplant journey is going to be that of hurry up and wait hurry up and wait. And you're going to feel like that. You know, I can still remember as well back in my case, which is, oh man, this is nine plus six. So what is that? Uh, 15 years ago, I can still remember that once they said, okay, you're going to need a transplant. To me, I knew transplant wasn't instantaneous, but I thought what they were doing to get me ready for transplant should be the evaluation itself, the actual listing, the wait time. For me, that should be very, very short. And when my doctors weren't, so to speak, getting it in gear, they weren't getting their ducks in a row very quickly. I got very aggravated. I think before I I find, uh, before I began, I should say, to get my first evaluation, there was probably a span of maybe two to three months that passed in there. And I can remember many times calling my doctor, actually getting him on the phone a couple of those times and chewing him out because things weren't moving quickly enough because it was the whole process really more than I wanted it to be was a hurry up and then wait process. And that continued on, not just for getting to the evaluation, through the evaluation, but even beyond that, when I was actually finally listed after four times being evaluated, it's another story for another day. But when I was finally listed on that fourth try, you know, I, Again, I wanted things to be instantaneous. I wanted to wake up the next morning with a phone call, a very sweet phone call, just as I was raising out of my slumber. I wanted me to be my coordinator very nicely. Hey, Mr. Merle, we got a heart from you. Take your time. Don't worry. Come to the hospital. We'll get you fixed up. That, again, wasn't going to be it. That wait time was brutal. For me, it was 265 days, so approximately 10 months. Uh, the average wait time right now, even still, for a heart transplant in the United States is 18. There are many being listed or being, I should say, transplanted sooner and later. Average is 18 months, so it's going to be hurry up and wait once again. The third stage I think you're going to encounter is that of trial and terror. 
I didn't say error. I said trial and terror because you're going to be involved in and dealing with facing some things in your future, perhaps, that are going to be very, very trying. They're going to test your faith, test your grit, test your gut, test your strength, whatever, your stamina. You're going to be tested and tried in the coming months, no doubt about it. And I'm, I'm not trying to sugarcoat anything, okay? Things do go more smoothly for some than others and, and all, but there are going to be some trials. There are going to be some of those tests while you're going through evaluation, for an example, that come back and doctor says, hey, you know, we found this when we were looking for that, so now we got to do this. And and you're going, to be, you're going to have your mind blown. You're going to have some issues that come up with the process itself. For me, it was when I went from – home waiting with a 24-hour IV bag on, which was not fun, but I mean, I was here to suddenly I go into the doctor one day casually for just my weekly follow-up. Bam, I'm in the hospital condemned there until transplant. That was a trying time. I mean, I, I came so close right then to saying, you know what? I just don't want to do this. I don't even want to be listed. If I've got to wait in the hospital an uh, hour to 15 minutes away from my children, my wife, my family, I don't want to be any part of this. Another one of those trials I had to endure. And then the terror that comes with that, I, I had many a nights uh, where there were some terrifying things that went on in that hospital, sometimes with my neighbors, people down the hall, but then sometimes with me. You know, I can remember specifically a time when I was laying in my room. I wasn't feeling well, no doubt about it. I, was, I felt like I was having some issue, but hadn't done anything with that yet as far as, you know, hitting the nurse, nurse call button. But I can remember seeing my big giant door. You know how big doors are on hospital. And that thing swung open, wham, hit the wall. Nurses, doctors ran in a panic. They said, you're in VTAC. You know, you're flatlining. This thing and that scared me to death because I was awake. I was aware. I wasn't unconscious. Scared me to death. Terror. There will be times of terror. But uh, those are kind of the more negative things. Let me get to the next part of this. When you get to the point where you're going to go in for that surgery, again, it'll be a trial. It'll be a terror. The recovery to a point will be that. But then there's another phase. Number four, that stage is rest and recover. And that's exactly what you need to do and you must do, okay? You need to rest. Now, I wasn't good at that. I had one of the better, uh, more uh, quick, uh, if you will, recoveries, just short of transplant anyway, that they had seen my doctor claim in the last 25 years. I mean, I was up and out of my bed within the same day, within 24 hours. I was walking down the hall within a week. I was walking four miles at a time and sometimes doing that multiple times a day. I was making a great strides or great strides toward recovery. But then three weeks post, I still vividly remember sitting down in my transplant uh, follow-up clinic visit. There were Those were happening twice a week. This is three weeks out. Sitting down, and I was complaining to my doctor, Dr. Talai, saying, I just don't feel right. I don't feel like I'm making any progress. You know, I'm, I'm just ready to give up. I don't know why I did this. And he looked at me, and he said, Mr. Merle, you are three weeks post-transplant. You've been sick for over 30 years. That's three decades, and you want to recover that quickly. Not going to happen. What was really the problem then, and I didn't realize it until hindsight, you know, sometimes in hindsight you can see things or, or sense things. What was really happening was I was working so hard to recover that I was taking two steps, two steps back. I was taking a step forward, but two steps back because I would kill myself one day, you know, walking my four or five miles on a treadmill, doing whatever, you know, exercising at, at a cardiac, cardiac, what is it? <laughs> I can't think anyway now, but the recovery. The um, you see, brain fog is a part of this. Not a stage that I'm including, but I'm in. I'm in stage six that I'm not going to talk about brain fog. Um, anyway, cardiac rehab. There it is, cardiac rehab. So I'm just a regular old guy without a lot of sense. Cardiac rehab. I was in cardiac rehab, and I can remember I'd kill myself one day, and then the next day I would miss cardiac rehab because I didn't feel like going. I'd be on the couch. My doctor said, slow down, rest, and recover. And you're going to have to recover. Your body's going through any type of surgery like this, especially a transplant surgery, very, very traumatic on the human body. And it will take every ounce of energy in you just to heal and to rebuild. And that's why a lot of times post-organ transplant, the first three, four weeks, uh, you may feel great, but you may not have the stamina that you want because your body's using up so much energy trying to heal. So you need that rest and the number five here also plan 
and purpose. Once you get past that stage where you feel like you've mostly recovered, for me, it was probably about nine months out. And that was a year out before I realized, hey, three months ago, you felt better and that you were 100% or better. That was about a, a nine month to a year out. But once you get to that place, you need to start planning and purposing to do something in life. Make a plan. You know, if that's return to work, return to school, you know, get a new career, a new job. If it's to become a stay-at-home dad, they call me Fami, father, mommy around here uh, while my wife works and my children are, are, you know, here in the home and such. Do whatever you're going to do, but make a plan for that. Don't make that an accidental or an incidental thing. Make a plan for your future and set down. If it takes it, you know, grab pencil and here, pen and you want to borrow mine, grab pen and paper and make a list of things that you want to accomplish, but plan to have a life, plan to fulfill your life, plan to use that gift that your donor and their families have given you to do something better. And that's where you need to have a purpose to go with that too. You know, a plan might be, well, I think I'll return to work, get back to the daily grind or, or whatever. But a purpose is I'm going to return to work, get back to the daily ground, but I'm going to make a difference in somebody's life. I'm going to give back particularly and especially I'm going to give back to the community that gave to me. You know, if it had not been for my donor, uh, Dickie, his family, somehow becoming aware of organ donation and, and, the, and the wonderful gift that that was, I wouldn't be alive today. And so back before my transplant, I was advocating very strongly. We were putting ads in the newspapers with my picture and my kids' pictures on it. You know, 900,000 people seeing that. I was making videos. I was doing everything I could to promote organ donation in the initial stage because I needed a transplant. You know, the whole campaign was save my daddy with my children's picture. Uh, but you know what? That, that is not and should not have been the end. Because once I got my gift, which I'm thankful for, thanks to God for that, but once that came, it's time to get a gift for somebody else. And so make a purpose in life, not just a plan, but a purpose in life that you can give back and that you can somehow be the number one advocate in your town for organ donation and the whole uh, the whole shebang, if you will. You know what a shebang is? I'm not sure, but we've always said that here. But the whole process, get ready and do that. So those are the five stages. I'll rename them again. Number one, shock and awe. Number two, hurry up and wait. Number three, trial and terror. Number four, rest and recover. And then number five, plan and purpose. I hope this has helped you out in some way. If it has, how about a thumbs up? Maybe hit the subscribe button, the bell notification. Perhaps even better, share this out with some people that you may be in contact with that are facing transplant. Let them get the heads up on these stages and let them know what to expect in the future. And I know they will greatly appreciate you for that. But thank you so much for joining me today. And until next time, stay stronger, my friends.